Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to uh, welcome you here today with our very special guest, Professor Charles Garton. Um, I'm sure that um, all of you know of him and his works, but let me just um, give a very brief biographical uh, introduction. Um, he's currently a senior adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins Sice here in Washington. Uh, for many years, he taught both at Union College and at Columbia University. Uh, he served as a senior advisor in the Office of Policy Planning in the State Department in the early 1990s and was very intimately involved in uh, a number of projects, including the um, initial enlargement of NATO. Um, he is a prolific writer and has published a number of very well-received books, including The Bloc That Failed, um, Hungary in the Soviet Bloc. Uh, his most recent one before uh, this book is Failed Illusions, uh, Moscow, Washington, Budapest in the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. And his latest book, which I highly recommend to you all, uh, it's big, is a wonderful collection of um, chapters about uh, uh, Dr. Brzezinski's life, uh, his right academic writings, his role in government, his role really as a critic um, of US foreign policy more recently. Um, so we welcome you and look forward to the presentation. There is some relationship between my growing age and the generosity of the introduction. So it's worth getting older, I think, because um, then they say nicer things about you. Uh, but I have no idea why that's so, but it is. And it's nice. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I am going to talk for 15 to 20 minutes at most uh, about the book, how it came about, what are the main uh, themes, and uh, then I'll, uh, since there are lots and lots of stories about uh, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski in this book, I'm going to tell you three or four of my favorite stories. Okay, and I gather that uh, one is uh, also uh, Professor Stent's uh, uh, favorite. It's one of those that I picked. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, how did this book come about? Uh, Brzezinski taught at SAIS, the, uh, I don't know if in this place we can mention SAIS Johns Hopkins here at all. It's, uh, number two, well, uh, some years it's number one, <coughs> some years it's number two, uh, but we look up to some of our colleagues at Georgetown and uh, uh, respect. Now, I used to teach here, by the way. I taught uh, twice, actually, uh, I think one semester each, many, many years ago. Um, one of the books you mentioned was introduced, in effect, tried out on, uh, on Georgetown students. That was the blog that failed in the early 1990s. Anyway, so this book came about because Brzezinski decided not to teach anymore uh, and, uh, uh, in effect, withdraw from Johns Hopkins in an active way. He does play a role. He does give a few lectures, meets with students, doesn't want to meet with faculty. Interestingly enough, he prefers to uh, uh, be with students. So anyway, uh, the dean at the time, Dean Einhor, uh, and uh, another associate dean had a conversation with him. And uh, walking back from that conversation about Brzezinski's future at SAIS, they thought that, uh, that uh, SAIS should sponsor a book about uh, Brzezinski, and they discovered that uh, there are no books about him, that uh, there are, you know, at least a dozen good or reasonably good books about, uh, about Kissinger, but none about Brzezinski. So they, the dean called me and asked, asked me if I'd be interested in uh, editing one. And I, first, I, I thought that they wanted to have a fast shrift, which means that every author would have to say something really nice about Brzezinski, and I had no, absolutely no interest in that. So I asked her if she would let me do a critical analysis, uh, respectful, uh, uh, but uh, not uncritical. And she was very much on board, and, uh, and that's how the book uh, started. It was up to me to select the topics, up to me only to me to select the authors, and, uh, and then edit and fight with the authors, about 15 of them, some of them, absolutely most of them, almost all of them, uh, truly wonderful and cooperative. Some I didn't have to edit at all. Um, others I did, a few. Uh, but I remain on speaking terms with all of them after uh, uh, years of, uh, two, two years of, of cooperation. And uh, 
I'm a tough editor, and uh, some of them uh, welcomed it, and uh, maybe two did not. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Brzezinski knew about the project, uh, but did not read it until it got published, or almost. That's one of the better stories I'm about to tell you. Uh, he and I talked about it. Uh, I have known him since 1970 uh, at Columbia University, and we have friendly relations. Um, uh, but we understood that if I began to talk to him in great detail about the book, uh, th then, then it would seem like uh, uh, you know he guided it from behind the scenes. Well, he did not, uh, because all he got until o the almost publication of the book, uh, all he got was the table of contents. So he knew who was writing and what topics I picked. He, nev he never ever suggested an author or a topic or an approach or anything of the sort. Now, when did he read the book is, a, is an interesting story. I kept waiting for the publisher, Johns Hopkins University Press, to give me a, a copy. And then I thought that when I get the first copy, I would walk over to CSIS, where his main office is, and give him a copy. This is not how it happened. Uh, I got a call uh, uh, one evening at home. And eventually, I began, this was uh, last spring, I began to understand that he was very familiar with the book. And I couldn't quite understand how come, where did he get it? I, I was supposed to have given it to him. Well, what happened was that uh, at uh, CSIS, the public relations person, uh, got uh, a, a preliminary copy uh, of the page proofs of the book so that CSIS would promote it and so on from Johns Hopkins Press. Now Johns Hopkins forgot to tell me this. And so this uh, PR person at CSIS walked into Brzezinski's office and congratulated him on this wonderful book. And so he, apparently the, the, this guy, I don't know his name, uh, he had the copy with him. And Brzezinski said, you know, I, I'd like to look at this. And so he took it home. And uh, as it turned out, uh, I know uh, some of the other authors too, he really read it very, very carefully. And uh, he had some critical comments, but by and large, he was then and he has been since very uh, happy with it. Uh, so that's the story of my relationship with him. It's still, it's still good despite some of the critical parts of this book, particularly on his China policy and maybe a couple of other things that I am about to mention. Now let's turn to the book. Uh, it, it is, as we, um, uh, uh, Professor Stent knows well, it is a combination of very academic chapters, particularly two chapters on, on, on him as a Sovietologist, which is how he started his career. Later on, he became an American foreign policy strategist. Uh, but he started out as a student of the Soviet Union, a Kremlin. Kremlinologist was another phrase that used to be used uh, where we would re be reading the tea leaves. Professor Stent was one of them, uh, one of us uh, reading the tea leaves, no real access to any, any information. But we knew history, we knew culture, and we put it in some kind of a, a mix like a salad. And then we came up with uh, wise uh, 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 insights about, uh, about the Soviet Union or the Soviet bloc. He, he was among the wisest. So we have two very academic style chapters uh, uh, in the book. Then we have a, a variety of other things uh, about his, his years as a national security advisor to uh, President Carter. Um, uh, we have some of his colleagues who worked with him in the White House writing shorter essays about his uh, approach to Latin America, his approach to China, his approach, uh, and, and, and as a colleague. Uh, those are some of the, I think, better, uh, certainly very readable uh, chapters um, in the book. Uh, so he's there as an academic, as a policymaker, as a strategist, and of course, a good deal of that for those of you who uh, know him from you know, PBS or MSNBC in particular. His daughter is Miko Brzezinski, 
by now quite m more famous uh, uh, than, than, than he is. Uh, that's television and beauty uh, uh, combined there. So, uh, uh, but he appears there very frequently. And I think the younger generation, I've gotten this feedback already about the book, knows him as a critic of the Bush administration more than anything else. Uh, uh, he was among the first who took on uh, the Iraq policy and criticized it when uh, Democrats uh, essentially caved, uh, uh, almost all of them, uh, fearful of the re of Republican charges that uh, they don't know, you know, national security and they're too soft on the outside world. They don't rely on uh, American power to get American values around. And so uh, many elected officials in particular, but others too outside the, the um, uh, uh, well, not in the government, in, uh, in the first decade of, of this century, uh, were reluctant to take on the administration. Brzezinski was not reluctant. He did think about it. He was not the first, but he was there. And so uh, one of the chapters of the book dealing with his approach in the Middle East calls him a dove. Now, this created one of the interesting uh, dialogues uh, and Brzezinski's response. The, the author was Jim Mann. I gave it the title, uh, uh, but um, uh, Mr. Mann, a wonderful writer on, on uh, U.S. foreign policy, was delighted with it. And so here is one disagreement that some of us uh, have had uh, with Brzezinski, myself including, and Jim Mann, and that is that he did used to be a, a, a cold warrior, a hawk, uh, which he prefers not to uh, discuss or mention, and he thinks he's been more consequential uh, than some of us think that. Well, be that as it may, that's, that's, we're all entitled uh, to views. He did not uh, jump on us for this, but uh, uh, the book, I think, comes down on the side of characterizing him as a, as a hardliner in, uh, in the Cold War, and uh, certainly far less of a hardliner, if not quite a dove, uh, since then. The military instrument of foreign policy is something that he does not uh, think bring, bring results and I think this has been a very powerful argument uh, and uh, I think it has taken root in, in, in Amer the American, American polity, rightly or wrongly. You don't have to agree with that but, uh, but I think that the United States is, is, uh, is, is remains active in the world but uh, has de-emphasized the military instrument. Just this week, of course, the Defense Department has announced a, s a fairly significant reduction uh, in our military expenditures. Now, what are the, um, the main uh, themes or context uh, of the book? Well, one has to do with the Cold War and, the, uh, and, the, the, um, and its aftermath, quite obviously. Um, uh, another one that I would call your attention to, actually, it is chapter one. Uh, it is, I think, the longest one. It has to do with the transformation of the American foreign policy elite. I think this is a very original uh, uh, chapter. Um, uh, uh, it has to do with the following. Until Kissinger and Brzezinski appeared on the scene, in the mid-1950s, both from at Harvard originally, then uh, Brzezinski moved to Columbia. Uh, initially, he did not get tenure at Harvard, and then they tried to get him back and, and give him tenure, but he declined. Um, until they appeared on the scene, uh, uh, you had to be from the Eastern establishment, almost certainly you had to be a wasp, uh, you had to be a male, uh, and you had to be white, and you sh probably, I think in all cases, to be in the elite, you couldn't have had an accent. Now, with Kissinger and Brzezinski, this began to change, began to change. Uh, and then, of course, others came on, including Madeleine Albright, much later, uh, lots of uh, women in high positions today, too, Susan Rice, and of course, uh, uh, Condi Rice uh, before that, uh, blacks in uh, several administrations in high positions. And I would have to say, speaking for myself, it certainly uh, is not a 
uh, a disadvantage to have an accent as I do. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I didn't become a, uh, I, I didn't occupy a very high position in, in any administration, nor did I want to, uh, but uh, this is just not an issue anymore. The changes in, in this country and in Washington, perhaps in particular, in the composition of the elite is nothing, uh, nothing less than remarkable. Uh, and nor was it easy. And so one of the stories that I would like to uh, share with you was from 1970, um, excuse me, I forgot, 74, uh, when uh, Brzezinski heard that the uh, governor of New York, uh, Averill Harriman, who was also a foreign policy heavyweight, uh, complained about him behind his back. Uh, how could a, you know, I, I don't know exactly what Harriman had said, but something probably to the effect, how could a Polish Catholic represent the United States in its dealings with the Soviet Union? And so Brzezinski, with his characteristic feisty uh, uh, temperament, he wrote the following note. Dear Mr. Harriman, I've been told by some friends that you expressed the view that my Polish background somehow disqualifies me from dealing objectively with the U.S.-Soviet relationship. Since uh, you are a blunt man, let me also say quite bluntly that I do not feel that Henry Kissinger's background disqualified him from dealing effectively with the Middle Eastern problem, nor do I think that your background as a millionaire capitalist prevents you from dealing intelligently with the Soviet communists. Yours sincerely, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, they reconciled. Her uh, Harriman apparently was a gentleman and, uh, and called and uh, they had lunch and uh, discussed the issue. Uh, and, but what I'm trying to tell you is that this has been extremely difficult. Uh, the changes in this country, is, is, I'm repeating now myself, has, has been remarkable, uh, very significant um, indeed, uh, comparable in terms of the foreign policy elite's composition, comparable to the fact that we now have uh, a black president. Now, uh, uh, I will, um, uh, because I much prefer to have a discussion with you and Professor Stent, I will, however, um, uh, mention two or three other uh, uh, stories. One has to do with, the, um, with Pope John Paul II. Um, uh, you know, they're both Polish. They spoke Polish to each other. Uh, uh, Brzezinski was in the White House, uh, uh, National Security Advisor, and uh, the Pope was in the Vatican, of course. And uh, the background to the story, it's, I do have to mention this, was that the Soviets, in their usually, usual paranoid way, uh, uh, believed, and now we know from the archives that this was not, a, not gossip or rumor, but actually true, the Soviet Politburo believed that the Pope's election uh, was engineered by Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, because they had to have some kind of conspiracy uh, to, to explain most things. This, they still do, I think, uh, the Russians, not the Soviets. Uh, there's always uh, a, a factual story cannot be true. Something, something else needs to be uh, uh, learned and unveiled uh, and uh, used not only as propaganda, but to convince themselves uh, that uh, uh, what's happening. In any case, against this background, uh, Brzezinski visited the Pope several times. And on one occasion, the Pope said to him, uh, I have the quotes in the book, but I, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, said to him, please come back and see me again. And uh, Brzezinski, in an, I think an unusual moment of modesty, uh, uh, said, uh, uh, you know, look, this is such a great privilege to, to see you. I can't just, uh, you know, drop by uh, to see you. And the Pope said, uh, look, you elected me, so uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have a right to come back. Uh, it's one of the stories that I like very much. Another one. Um, Uh, it's in the book's last uh, chapter, which is a long interview that I did with him. Um, I asked him, uh, 
why he didn't change his name. Uh, because when you become a U.S. citizen, as I did uh, a couple of years after he did, you know, the judge gives you a chance to change your name. So, for example, my last name is Gatti, but my first name is not, uh, uh, my Hungarian name is not Charles, but I always hated my first name, so I was just delighted uh, 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 to change that. So, in any case, um, um, I raised the question of why he didn't change his impossibly difficult name, because it's really hard to, pr if you're not Polish, uh, uh, you know, it's not, not so easy. And he said that um, he was confident, and I quote now, in America, people can become American without masking their ethnic identity. America is the only country in the world where someone named Zbigniew Brzezinski can make a name for himself without changing his name. <laughs> and I thought that was a very pointed and good way to end the book. So uh, thank you very take, much. Take it from here. Um, uh, th as I said, it's a wonderful book. You've highlighted a lot of the most important parts of it. Um, <clears throat> let me just make a few more comments and then throw it up to questions. So I really think that one of the, the great things that shines through in this book is this classical American immigrant story. Mm -hmm. And it's that anything is possible in the U.S. And um, uh, by the way, one of the things that the book also tries to put to rest is this myth that Kissinger and Brzezinski were always rivals and antagonists. Mm -hmm. And there's a chapter showing that actually they had a very cordial relationship, continue to. But um, another thing that you have in there that it's not only the correspondence with Avril Harriman, but it's when he was appointed national security advisor, the former defense secretary, Lovett, said, we can't have someone who's not an American uh, negotiating with the Soviet Union, they're too biased. I mean, not an American. And this man had been an American since 1970s. Before. This is the 1970s. In the 1970s. So again, it really shows you, you know, how far um, we have come from that. And as you say, his great um, appreciation of this. A couple of other things I think that come through very much in the book, which you really didn't dis have time to discuss, is he was a very successful, tough bureaucratic player when he was national security advisor. Mm -hmm. So the whole. Um, rivalry between him and Secretary of State Vance, um, and I would say for a lot, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Mr. Brzezinski prevailed there. Um, so I, and then the, the accomplishments of those four years at the Carter administration, now we may think of some of the failures, the hostage crisis and things like that, but all of the other things that are discussed there was a huge agenda. Um, normalization of relations with China, as you say, um, the um, chapter co-written by my late colleague uh, Nancy Bernkoff Tucker, which is critical of you know what it did there. or didn't do for Taiwan, but still, that was a major accomplishment. The Camp David peace accords, obviously. Um, other things like the Panama Canal. So um, uh, you know, a, a lot of salt and and um, exactly and salt. Thank you. <laughs> also, a very important um, accomplishment. So he really got a lot done, and he managed the the bureaucratic infighting quite well. And there's obviously a very um, uh, a warm tribute to him by President Jimmy Carter at the beginning of the book. Um, I guess some of the other, <coughs> but I guess some, one of the other more controversial aspects, and it's alluded to, but um, <coughs> Brzezinski defends itself there, is the policy in Afghanistan. The policy of arming the Mujahideen, supporting um, them so that they could defeat the Soviets, and we all know that that helped defeat the Soviets, but it also gave rise to you know what became the Taliban and then parts of that that became Al-Qaeda. And he himself, when you, I guess it's in your interview with him where he says that he, um, you know, he thinks he did the right thing, that's obviously something that other people might find uh, more controversial. Um, and then, as you say, the other very interesting part is, is his evolution as a foreign policy critic, particularly the Bush administration, uh, but even now in a kind of television personality. So he's had all those incarnations. Oh, and finally, to come back to the point about his, him as a theorist of totalitarianism and a Sovietologist, he was really proven right. Um, I mean, he did predict in the grand failure, more or less, what would happen um, and how the Soviet Union would collapse. And maybe I'll then tell one anecdote uh, from the book, because I was involved in it. Um, and that is um, uh, that in 1989, Professor Gardi organized a conference in Moscow um, with the then Institute for the Study of the World's Socialist Economic System, Oleg Bogomolov. And it was the first US-Soviet scientific academic conference on Eastern Europe. 
And we held, the first one was actually held in the United States. Uh, and then we went to the Soviet Union. And we're now talking about September of 1989. So everything is happening. And uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, if you like, was the head of the delegation. Um, and the first thing is that when we arrived there, uh, obviously through no um, fault of yours, we, it turned out that we'd been downgraded, right? We were supposed to stay in the government house, and we got there and we found out we were going to stay in the Pionierskie Lager Druzhba. So we're in a pioneer camp where the um, children of Eastern European officials stayed, although Dr. Brzezinski was able to stay, obviously, at the embassy. Um, and we had these very interesting discussions with our Soviet colleagues, and then the highlight, and it's described in the book, was that Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, gave a lecture at the Diplomatic Academy in Moscow. And Brzezinski really was the Sovietologist that the Russians loved to hate, right? I mean, they read everything he wrote with a fine tooth comb, they analyzed it, and then they criticized him for everything, you know, including, obviously, electing um, uh, Wojtyla as pope. But we, I remember walking into that diplomatic academy, you know, people were hanging from the walls, there was standing room only. And he gave a very good and tough speech, commending Gorbachev for what he had done so far, but saying that he had to, you know, recognize the independence and the right to uh, freedom of the, of the East European countries of the fraternal allies. Um, and he got a standing ovation, I remember that. It was just, you know, um, <clears throat> very, positive. And then he went from there to Katyn. Again, this is all described here. This was really the first time that a Western official um, had gone uh, to Katyn. He had televised discussions with officials there. This is just when, you know, Gorbachev and the others had begun to, they'd already begun to admit what really happened there. Uh, but that was really very, very memorable. And I believe that was his first visit to the Soviet Union, right? And I think he had actually never been there before. He, he was in Stalin's, uh, uh, right after Stalin's death, Oh, yes. right after Stalin's death, okay. But that was his first time then in, oh. in the modern era. Anyway, um, that's all described here too. Um, and um, um, and I, again, you know, I commend you all these different parts. And what's so great is that you have such a variety of approaches towards dealing with uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. And it gives you a very, a very well-rounded picture. So. Mm, thank you. Um, Sure. I have an allergy, so I apologize. Could you identify yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Monica. And uh, I'm a researcher. 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 Um, I work on Wall Street in my sabbatical, mm -hmm. but I also work with Wall Street in my Also work with Dresden with Beauty, depending on the infrastructure. I work on prices, so around me, the journey is something wrong. That's how we, you know, that's how we're in emergency. My question to you is, now, knowing the national security of the team, you know, Susan is supposed to. And for example, Tom Donald before. Don Olin, yeah. Yes. What do you, how do you compare it to the previous? Well, that's a very, uh, the, we, I do have a chapter there, not about uh, Susan Rice or, or Don Olin, uh, but an overview uh, um, of, of the NSP, how it operated. Uh, uh, what kind of bureauc the bureaucratic player uh, that that he was, the infighting that is inevitable usually between the State Department and the NSC. Uh, um, I would say that uh, the comparison the, the, uh, uh, would have to include, this is a big topic that you ask, uh, would have to include that Brzezinski, as well as Kissinger, uh, played the role that they played during the Cold War. And that gave foreign policy uh, uh, the kind of significance that it no longer has. Whether it should have or not is another question. I'm not talking about should. I'm telling, I'm saying what it is. Uh, today, foreign policy is of uh, um, a marginal uh, uh, significance to the leaders of our country, including President Obama. 
Um, it was more so under Bush, uh, and as a, maybe as a result of what I think many Americans, including Republicans, believe were the excesses of military engagement, uh, there is a reaction to that. Uh, when you take a look at the evolution of U.S. foreign policy, you almost always see a, uh, that an incoming leader or leaders react to the previous uh, uh, generation or the previous leaders and try to do something either different or even the opposite of that. So what we now have, I think, is still a reaction to, uh, to Bush and, uh, and today's leaders uh, are uh, more uh, aware of the political consequences, domestic political consequences of what we do. As a result, it's, it's, um, that we still voice views, as we do now, for example, about Ukraine. Uh, Susan Rice was on television Sunday, and uh, uh, Kerry uh, told the Russians, you know, and Hegel uh, that today, you know, uh, don't you do that. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, and then what? You know, what are we going to do if they do it? Uh, I fail to see any reaction if they decide to take back the Crimea or if they, um, um, you know, do more than that. I don't really expect that, but they are next door and Ukraine used to be part of, the, of Russia and of the Soviet Union for sure. So what I'm trying to say is that the significant thing is that in the Cold War, foreign policy making was, uh, was sovereign and uh, Brzezinski did not have to pay that much attention to, you know, public opinion, and Carter supported him. So in addition to that, I would say that in the case of Brzezinski and Kissinger, you dealt with strategists who looked beyond their nose, uh, uh, not just what, you know, was happening this week or next week or today. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's actually it was one of the things that amazed me, even on the policy planning staff in the 90s, that ev events or trends did not matter. What mattered was what was happening today and tomorrow. And I, th I, think, I think for Brzezinski, they, they, they had a plan, particularly with respect to China. And Kissinger had the same thing, and Nixon. Now you have to give him credit for that. I, 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 it's a very big okay. question. Other questions? First of all, I would like, I'm visiting Christopher at Ceres. Uh, so in Poland, we also recognize Professor Brzezinski as the Polish party, you know. So every time I went to visit Poland, you know, we welcome him very warmly. You know, last time I, I attended the meeting with Professor Brzezinski in the presidential palace by last year. And he said that because this is the presidential initiative that young, you know, active people from academia met, you know, a significant person from, from the policy. And for the policymaker, and also Brzezinski said, I know that we had Fukuyama, I know that we had Kissinger, but I'm the first speaker who was speaking to you in Poland. You know? So in Poland, we also must do, do our homework to prepare more books you know, about his book, in that sense. Because uh, also for us, this is that we know about him, but we don't know it's, about this, him. this book is coming out in Polish, yeah. It's been, as we speak, it's being translated, yes. So, um, but my question is uh, concerning the, what the current Europe and US administration take, can take from this. Because after NSA and after current situation in Ukraine, we in Poland say that this is like the reborn of the, let's say, easy Cold War. Now that we can easily see that the Western world and the Russian Federation, they have just easy conflict of interest. And I would like to ask you if current situation can, you know, like put your book in the, another view of, the, of this Cold War. Uh, the book is not meant to be advocacy. Uh, it's meant to be analysis. And uh, a distinction has to be made between the two. So this is historical analysis uh, uh, and, and, and insights into Brzezinski's character. He is not an easy person uh, to open up. Uh, uh, he's, uh, you know, I could tell you a couple of stories about that, but uh, per perhaps, I mean, it, not in an unkind way, he's standoffish. 
you know, he keeps distance. Uh, uh, now, two points. One is with respect to his Polishness. It's very deep. Uh, but not everybody in Poland loves him anymore. Uh, because about a year and a half ago, he gave an interview. I forgot now where it appeared. Uh, maybe in Gazeta Wyborcza, I, I forgot now where. And without mentioning uh, the main opposition leader, Kaczynski's name, uh, but uh, it, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that he was blasting uh, uh, Kaczynski uh, as, a, as a primitive and ignorant uh, um, a man, who, by the way, is leading in the polls today. The Polish elections will be held next year. And uh, uh, I can't even, I don't know, I haven't talked to him about this, but I don't think uh, uh, Brzezinski is very uh, uh, happy about that prospect. He has a very high opinion of Polish foreign policy today. And he shares your concern, as every poll does, about Ukraine. Obviously, Ukraine is the single most important event in Polish foreign policy now in uh, two decades. This is what's happening there. Uh, now, the other question you're asking me about what, you know, about the U.S. role and so on. Well, with the end of the Cold War, Eastern Europe has lost most of its significance. In the 1990s, there was still, till about the early uh, 2000s, there was a tremendous interest in expanding NATO. And as Professor Stan mentioned, I played a little role in that. Uh, Brzezinski was very outspoken and, and supportive of that. And this was still by an era of some bipartisanship, which of course is today is, is history. You know, I remember talking with Senator Lugar, a Republican, uh, certainly with Brzezinski a lot uh, about this. And there were many others, uh, McCain, even though it was a Democratic administration, uh, you know, under Clinton, but still, uh, and in Europe too, you know. Uh, uh, so this is over. It's over for two, two main reasons. Now, this is a topic, you know, I, 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 I have to speak for myself, not for Brzezinski. It's over for two reasons. Uh, uh, one is that the, the American public is, uh, has put a check mark to Poland. I called it, I wrote an article once about this, the check mark syndrome. You know, so uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, the Baltic states, check mark. We've, we've done what we had to do. You're in NATO, and you know, because of that, the European Union, which initially was very grudging about this, also took them in. So you have now 11 members in the EU and more in NATO, and I think most American officials would say, this is all we can do. And uh, uh, how we can protect Polish interests in Ukraine, I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, these, these threats are so empty. I mean, Putin must be laughing his head off. Uh, although right now, he, I mean, he's the loser. And, you know, the European Union, and we are the winners, and et cetera. But uh, I, this is not the end of the story. We'll have to wait and see. I think the other thing implicit in his question was, are we seeing a return to something that you might call Cold War light? In other words, it looks very much, if you look, you know, Russian troops at military maneuvers near Crimea, people in Crimea, some of them saying we want to be part of Russia. You know, uh, as you say, our officials saying, no, 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 if Russia does anything, there'll be consequences, not clear what they are. But does it feel to you as if we are sort of sliding back into something that... No. That, that looks like the Cold War, even though it's not the Cold War anymore? Well, I would not presume to discuss this in your presence. You know, <laughs> and she has just published a, a major book on U.S.-Russia relations. So uh, who am I now to uh, take, take this on? Um, it would be much more interesting for me if you uh, uh, address the issue, uh, to be sure. Um, uh, look, um, for reasons that I... I, I I can explain, but not, I don't fully understand. Uh, this country has had uh, uh, a great deal of hostility towards the Soviet Union and Russia over many, many uh, decades, at least uh, since the early uh, 20th century, but maybe before. Now, uh, 
the hostility is, uh, there's good reasons for that. But when you think about the friendly approach to China, you know, I make a joke of this to my students because this is a question that has come up. I say, well, Chinese food is so good, you know, and the missionaries were there and so on. But it, I know it's not a good enough explanation. But the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of hostility there. I mean, uh, the, the public is now getting, maybe it's Cold War, I don't know what you call it, but there is a good deal of hostility towards the Russians. Uh, I'll, I'll have to read your book more carefully uh, to come up with a better answer. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, uh, we cannot do what the Cold War was because we don't have the instruments of policy to counter them. I mean, we're withdrawing from Europe. We have, what, 40,000, 50,000 troops now in Western Europe. Um, NATO does have some exercises occasionally in the uh, Baltic Sea just to make sure that the three Baltic states are protected, which is very good. I strongly support that. But you know, if uh, we are mobile uh, militarily, but we don't e economically what? So they're promising a billion dollars. Uh, Kerry, you know, if, if I were Ukraine, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold out for that because we can promise it, but we will not probably deliver it on time. We may deliver some of it, but we will not deliver it all. So there is in your country, in Poland and throughout the region, a good deal of skepticism about the United States. And, uh, and of course, almost all of my friends there would like uh, us here to be far more active. And, uh, and they want, some of that I think is justified. They want to be stroked, you know, because they like, they want to be invited to the White House, you know. Uh, because Kwasniewski was here, I think Tusk was here once, but he would like to be here a second time. I mean, some of this it, it may seem for academics a bit uh, silly, but it tells you that in that part of the world, despite all the anti-Americans uh, that have come out of the woodwork in the last decade, or so all these nationalists, some of the crazies, anti-foreign, anti-Western banks, anti EU, anti-Semites, I mean, you name it. They are anti practically everything except themselves. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we're just not going to do it. I don't, I, it doesn't matter who is in the White House. Now, if there is an invasion of Ukraine by the Russians, which I don't expect at all, uh, well, that, that's, you know, that's a new ball game. Other questions? Can I just say a few things sure. about what you said? Sure. Okay, please. I'd like to comment on your comments. Sure, okay. um, you know, why you recall the 1989 uh, events in Moscow? By the way, uh, formally, I was the head of the delegation, yes. and Brzezinski was, of course, by considered by everybody. And I stepped back because I, organ I, I was asked to organize it by by IREX. Uh, to do that. It was a memorable day. I, I, frankly, I remember talking with you ha half the night one, one, one <laughs> night. Do you remember that? I don't know what we talked about. I'm sure it's taped somewhere <laughs> in, in, in the <laughs> files, in the files there. Uh, it must be there somewhere. Um, yes, they hated Brzezinski, and still he got the extraordinary reception and applause. I think they hated him not only because he understood them. They don't like that. They really don't like it when, when, when somebody goes to the core of what it was to be the Soviet Union and size it up pretty darn well, as, as you mentioned, uh, pretty d darn well. Uh, but they also, they could, you know, there were many others. I mean, there was, you know, your professor Ulam at Harvard, certainly a brilliant, uh, um, a Sovietologist and and, uh, and and others, John Hazard at Columbia, and uh, on and on and on. You know what? I have a private theory. As long as you don't tell anybody, because it's so silly, they could pronounce Brzezinski's name because it's a Slavic name. You know, Ulam, although he was also Polish, but you know, Marshal Schulman, uh, that, that's that's harder. Brzezinski, they 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 could they could pronounce it and. Uh, uh, 
I don't want to be so silly about this now. There are some, um, the foreign policy successes of the Carter administration comes through, and I think this should surprise you, because the general image of the Carter administration is so negative um, for a variety of reasons that when you read this book and you see those that Professor Stent mentioned, you know, uh, uh, and there are some of the pictures there too, playing chess with uh, Israeli uh, Prime Minister Begin, for example, uh, is really a, a classic, uh, Brzezinski does. But I think Carter's domestic policy and the inflation at the end was so, uh, uh, was so negative, was so bad, that, um, uh, that that plus the end of the Carter administration with the Iranian hostage crisis left a mark on, on the whole administration that I think is profoundly unfair and untrue. And I think in this respect, this book is uh, something of a corrective because there, there were real, real successes. Then I'd like to say something about the infighting. Uh, I, uh, in some ways, it relates to your, uh, your question as well. This is built in the American system. Uh, it's, it's all the time. It's, you know, the State Department wants one thing and then the White House wants something else. The president is entitled to this. The president sided with Brzezinski and not with Vance, I think, on every issue. He was polite with Vance, but he just didn't think so. And what's his reason? One reason was that, well, Carter gives at least two reasons for this. One is that when he needed a paper, to highlight an issue. The State Department took a month to uh, present the paper because it went from this bureau to that bureau. It had to be cleared by it, so on, so on, so on. Brzezinski got it done the next day. He assigned it to somebody and he said, I need this by noon tomorrow. And it was there. And then he may have reworked it or whatever, but gave it to Carter. Well, this is, this is in the bureaucracy, in, a, in the Cold War especially, when things were happening all the time. This was invaluable. The other one, the other reason was that the State Department leaked badly. And because uh, Vance's uh, the second level, particularly Richard Holbrook well, uh, and Marshall Schulman, uh, these were working for Vance, and they told the press what was going on, and the press, by and large, the Washington press, sided with Vance. Um, I think, uh, again, it's human part. Brzezinski is anything but chummy. You know, he cannot sit down and say, "Hey, uh, how is the little league for your kid?" or you know, whatever it is that that people talk about. That's not politics. You cannot do that with him. You can yeah, he is just not able. I have to say I'm, you know, reasonably good friend of his now and have been for decades and my wife was his student and got an A, which is a big deal. St she still has the written note that, uh, that she got from him. Uh, but I'll tell you one story. Uh, a student at SAIS, that other institution, wrote a paper about Brzezinski as a leader for a leadership uh, course that somebody taught and interviewed me for his paper about Brzezinski. And among other things, I told the students that Brzezinski, in my view, this was uh, a year or two before uh, the book, uh, was brilliant but standoffish, you know, uh, uh, that you couldn't wa really warm up to him. So uh, the paper apparently uh, reached him. And the student put this as the motto of his paper. You know, <coughs> brilliant but standoffish, Charles Gatti. So next time I'm having lunch with him, I go to CSIS at that time, they were still on K Street. So I, I wait in the lobby with uh, a third, third friend, um, uh, also from Columbia University. And uh, he, comes, he comes down and he hugs me. And I said, what the heck, what is going on here? Now this is a, he says, well, I just wanted to prove that I'm not as standoffish as you said I was. I didn't know again, you know, it's, um, uh, and so Vance won the public debate because Holbrook 
was cut out of the Chinese uh, story. As, as the chapter shows, uh, Richard Holbrook was then Assistant Secretary for East Asia, and um, uh, Brzezinski just didn't want him to be in, and Carter agreed that the State Department people are, you know, that's my word, useless anyway. And so uh, uh, Holbrook went to the press, you know, to Marvin Kalb. I mean, some of these names, you, you youngsters, mean nothing uh, by now. Uh, very influential television and, and uh, uh, James, uh, James Reston, I think. Um, and, uh, uh, and so Vance got the good press, and Brzezinski got the terrible press, uh, but the president supported Brzezinski. It's, and it, you know, if you think it's, I don't know today's stories, I don't know uh, uh, whether the president is always, always with Kerry or Susan Rice. I mean, there are years when things are a little better, and that, that was bad with Kissinger. If anything, it was worse when he did not have both positions, because at one point he was both Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. Then there was harmony. He agreed with uh, himself. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, it was easier. I don't know how it is today, I, uh, exactly, between Kerry and Susan Rice. I know that the Condi Rice had a hell of a time with uh, Cheney, uh, with uh, Rumsfeld. Um, and um, uh, so it's, 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 it's written into our system. But in other countries, too, somebody no close to a prime minister as a foreign policy aide is, is, is uh, likely to run into conflict with the foreign ministers. Brzezinski was a good bureaucratic player, as, as Professor Stent says, because he had the president's backing. Uh, it's as simple as that. If you don't have the president's backing, forget it. Forget it. But he, uh, and you know, some of the critics say that he played to Carter's weaknesses and exploited it and so on. Uh, this is not what Carter says, either in his memoirs or what he writes in the book. Uh, here, or what he wrote in Foreign Affairs about it. He said, uh, he said about Brzezinski, he says, whenever I went on a foreign trip, I arranged for Brzezinski to sit next to me because next to my wife, he was the best companion. He says, S some of the time he was all wrong, uh, says Carter now, but he was a terrific companion. You know, I think they worked well together, and uh, Vance did not. Well, maybe I'll ask you a final question. What do you think the most controversial parts of the book are? Well, uh, since I'm so terribly self-critical of myself, as you probably know, I would say, say uh, controversial is that I left out some things. And I left out his ro role, I mean, it's mentioned, but I did not. Uh, ask anybody to write about this, and I, I don't know exactly why it's, it's, a, it's a mistake. Uh, uh, if, you if you have a chance to review the book, don't mention this. But uh, there is very little there about his role in Vietnam. And uh, he was a very strong supporter, one of the most outspoken supporter of uh, President Johnson's war, or President Kennedy's war in Vietnam. He went there uh, in... Uh, I think in 67 or 68, and realized that this was unwinnable, and then uh, became uh, Hubert Humphrey's uh, uh, chief advisor uh, and tried to position Humphrey, uh, Johnson's vice president, uh, to be critical, somewhat critical of the war without losing Johnson's support. Well, that was acrobatics and very difficult. And um, uh, I should have written it. This is this probably you know uh, somebody sh might have noticed it, but they haven't. There there is uh, relatively little about uh, about Eastern Europe. He wrote a major book on the Soviet bloc, which is covered, but e interestingly enough, there is no separate chapter except about Poland in the 1980s. You know, which I think is a, a revealing chapter based on archives in Moscow as well as Warsaw and Washington, and that's, that's uh, very good. But the others uh, are left out. Now, in terms of what is there, well, clearly the China chapter 
is, I don't know what you think, I know you read this, the China chapter is controversial because the authors, um, one is Professor Tucker who pa has passed away since then, the authors insisted on, on um, describing Brzezinski as being right about his approach to open up to China, but very wrong about how he went about it. And uh, I, had, I had problems with that. The chapter was, went through some versions, uh, but I think this is the most controversial. Uh, I don't share the view. I mean, there are lots of things in the book, by the way, that I, you know, I, I, I did not change, as long as it was respectful, uh, but it could be critical. Uh, I, I didn't care at all, and I, in fact, I encouraged that. Uh, I didn't want to fast drift. But this chapter is, um, is not one I would have written, because if he was so right, you know, outside of Washington, who cares? Who could possibly care about how he went about his business and whether he did put down Richard Holbrook or didn't put him down? I mean, uh, this, is, this is beltway nonsense, if you ask me. It doesn't, it just does not matter because the historic opening to China, about which I have very serious reservations, by the way, uh, uh, as well, you know, I mean, that's what counts. I have reservations because human rights was held up I in the approach to the Soviet Union, but it has never been held up by Brzezinski or others towards China. And I find that inconsequential. Uh, my own view of foreign policy has a lot to do with the democracy and human rights, and, uh, and uh, I think Kissinger and, and Brzezinski and all the others who, uh, uh, who hold the China opening practically sacred, uh, I think, uh, uh, are mistaken. Well, that was a very clear statement. Um, the book is for sale there. Please join me in thanking Professor Gotti for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. And all of these hard